People often overlook just how important and influential the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was. Finished in 1973, but not released until 1974, the movie laid the foundation for numerous slasher films that followed. While Jason, Freddy, and Michael Myers went on to a greater level of success, the character of Leatherface is still revered as one of the quintessential horror icons. It was banned in many countries upon its release for being despicable. The ironic thing is the movie was not as gory as it was perceived to be. Much of the violence takes place off screen, and the blood was kept to a minimum. Director Toby Hooper was initially aiming for a PG rating and was shocked when the movie came back with an X. Hooper trimmed the film to get an R rating, but still had problems keeping it in some theaters. Despite all the problems, the movie was a monumental success. For a film that cost somewhere between $100,000 and $300,000, it went on to gross over $30 million in its eight-year theatrical run. A large part of the success of the film was the marketing campaign that pushed it as being based on a true story. While the character of Leatherface is loosely based around the serial killer Ed Gein, the events in the film are nothing more than a work of fiction. This sort of marketing was used again years later with another independent horror film, The Blair Witch Project. In the years that followed, Hooper went on to make an amazing variety of films, from The Fun House to Life Force and even The Incredible Poltergeist. In 1986, Hooper returned to the franchise with The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The film had a larger budget and was much more ambitious than the refined original. It also was much gorier and bordered on cartoonish levels of violence at some points. It didn't achieve the same level of success as the original, but it has become a well-loved cult classic. The Carson name the series picked up was a reference to Kit Carson, who wrote the sequel. He was also married to horror legend Karen Black. With slashers being very popular at the time, New Line Cinema acquired the rights to the series. They were looking to convert Leatherface into the next big anti-hero, and began production on Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Even though the film references events from the previous films, it was intended to be a reboot of the franchise. Hooper didn't return to direct, but he was a supervisor during the initial stages. Directing duties went to Jeff Burr, who previously directed Stepfather 2 and From a Whisper to a Scream. Even though the film was pitched as a brutal and more graphic entry into the franchise, some of the producers got cold feet and ordered much of the gore to be removed. Even with much of the gore removed, the film still had to be edited in order to get down to an R rating. The film was released in 1990, and on top of receiving numerous low ratings, it also underperformed. Most folks hated the R-rated cut, but thankfully in 2003, a restored, uncut version was released on DVD. This version was much better, and now the film feels whole, instead of the choppy mess it was back in 1990. Then came the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This was another attempt to reboot the franchise by loosely remaking the original. After all the trouble with Leatherface, the studio had little faith in the franchise, and only gave the film a $600,000 budget. The film was finished in 1994, but sat on a shelf until 1995, when it was screened at the South by Southwest conference. After that, the film went back to the vault, where it would have stayed if not for the two breakout stars of the film. In 1996, Jerry Maguire with Renee Zellweger was released, and that same year, A Time to Kill with Matthew McConaughey. The Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a film that they both did early in their careers that they would rather have forgotten. While Renee Zellweger has actually joked about it, in the case of Matthew McConaughey, his agent tried to stop the release of the film because seeing the actor running around with robot legs that he controlled via remote <laughs> made the new leading man look ridiculous. No less ridiculous than failure to launch, in my opinion. The studio didn't care, and in 1997, they recut the film and released it as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. They also had new cover art, which prominently displayed Zellweger and McConaughey. The movie was poorly received, but has gone on to become a small cult hit due to just how bizarre it was. The film series sat dormant until 2001, when filmmakers Michael Bay, Brad Fuller, and Andrew Form started the production company Platinum Dunes. They bought the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in a deal with New Line Cinema to have them distribute the film. This being the third time the series has been rebooted, they decided to do a straight-up remake of the original. The film was a brash, loud affair that traded an overwhelming amount of gore for actual scares. Even though the critics hated the film, it was a big hit, raking in over $100 million in its theatrical run. The film cost $9.5 million, which cost more than the four previous films combined. Platinum Dunes knew they struck gold, so they went about remaking horror classics like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, The Amityville Horror, and The Hitcher. 
They all made money, but none of them were particularly liked. In 2006, Platinum Dunes released Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning, a prequel to the remake. The film majorly underperformed and pulled in about half of what the previous film did. Shortly thereafter, Platinum Dunes announced that they would not be making a third film. Producer Carl Mazzacone was a fan of the original film and didn't like how poorly the series had been treated over the years. He was looking to take over the franchise but didn't want to do yet another remake, so with Twisted Pictures and Lionsgate, he acquired the rights of the movie to make a series of sequels that picked up right after the events of the first film. He wanted to make a film that honored the original instead of trying to one-up it. So they set off to make the first true sequel in over two decades, simply titled Texas Chainsaw or Texas Chainsaw 3D. With the Saw franchise winding down, Lionsgate had hoped that this would be their new yearly release. They signed on for a six-picture deal hinging on the success of the first one. They want the new series to be as authentic as possible, so they went back to the original house from the first film. The house was originally located in La Frontera, Texas, but was moved to Kingsland, where it was renovated and turned into a restaurant. The crew went there and measured every aspect of the house. They took hundreds of screenshots from the original film, and along with the measurements, they built an exact replica of the house, right down to the chainsaw marks on the door. The attention to detail they had when they rebuilt the house was staggering. They meticulously matched everything from the wallpaper to the bloodstains and even the chicken feathers. All this work put into something that made it even harder for them to burn down. The opening was a truncated version of the original film that led into the sequel. They scanned the original 16mm print of the film, cleaned it up, and added some 3D effects. They brought in four actors from the series, John Dugan, Marilyn Burns, Bill Moseley, and Gunnar Hansen. John Dugan was in his 30s when he played the grandfather in the original. He had prosthetics on him to make him look older. He reprised the role 40 years later. Marilyn Burns played Sally, the final girl in the original. She came back to play Verna Carson, the deceased grandmother. Bill Moseley was fan favorite Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Since Sony owned the rights to the characters of 2, they brought him on board to play Drayton Sawyer. Drayton was originally played by Jim Seedow, but sadly he died in 2003. They digitally inserted Mosley into the footage of the original as a way to help tie the old footage in with the new. Gunnar Hansen was the original Leatherface. They brought him on board to play Boss Sawyer, and this was his first Texas Chainsaw Massacre he returned to after the original. He was asked in past productions, but each time the amount of money they offered him was insultingly low. This wasn't a case of him being a prima donna. The amount offered was well below what his pay should have been. They brought in John Lusenhop to direct. He had a deep respect for the original and even worked with Hansen for some story ideas. He went above and beyond to keep this as faithful as possible. They included tons of homages to the original. The Hitchhiker, the Armadillo, the Van, although the original Van was a Ford Econoline, not a Volkswagen. The Camera Noise, the classic red shorts butt shot, the girl in the freezer, and of course, the famous door slam. The first guy to die in both films was bludgeoned to death by Leatherface while walking through the house alone. The chainsaw Leatherface uses is the exact make and model from the original film. Sheriff Hooper was an homage to director Toby Hooper. The sheriff also held the original chainsaw so the audience could get a good look at it. Hansen even does the tongue thing like Leatherface. In keeping with continuity, Leatherface walks with a limp since he accidentally cut his leg with a chainsaw. After they finished the film, they had a private screening for director Toby Hooper. He genuinely enjoyed the film and gave it his blessing. That was something that they didn't have to do, but they wanted to show respect to the creator. With the start of the new movie, the people from town had come for some good old-fashioned Texas justice after finding Sally since her escape. It takes place on August 19th, the day after the events of the first film. A lynch mob shows up and burns the whole place down. One of the locals finds a baby and takes her away to raise her as their own. Years later, Heather discovers she was really adopted slash kidnapped because her grandmother died and left her assets to her. As a cool little nod to her character, Heather is now a butcher. Heather now heads to Texas with some of her friends to discover more about her past. Even though this is a direct sequel, they kind of cheated the time frame. The original took place in 1973, and the sequel takes place in current times, roughly 2011, so that would make Heather 38 years old. While they go out of their way to cover up the years, they never explicitly say it was 1973. They imply that the movie was 1983, and the sequel takes place in 2005, which would make Heather 22. They took a risk in hoping the audiences wouldn't notice, and honestly, I didn't notice the first time through because I was, um, distracted. Alexandra Daddario was wonderful as Heather. She embodied a strength as she went from victim to badass over the course of the film. She's also stunning. Clint Eastwood's son Scott played the local cop Carl. Dan Yeager was the new Leatherface. 
He consulted with Hansen on how to properly portray the character. In some of the sequels, and especially the 2003 remake, they made Leatherface into a hulking mass, a super killer, and pretty much just a generic villain who wore a mask. A large part of what made Leatherface so terrifying in the original was that he wasn't some bodybuilder. He was a hillbilly with a big gut in the mind of a child. Jaeger studied Hansen's movements and tried to mimic them as much as possible. The film does have 3D, but it's the kind that helps the action rather than taking you out of the movie. As they said, they used it as a punctuation and not a gimmick. They tried to do as many practical effects as possible. They brought in K&B effects to give the film a more realistic look. K&B was not big on CGI, so it was used sparingly. CGI can go fuck itself. <laughs> when Kenny is hooked in the back, they used a real metal hook. They had a steel plate with a loop and a blood pack, so Leatherface would hook him and then drag him down the stairs. The blood that hit the camera wasn't CGI, it was the blood pack accidentally spraying the camera. It looked so good, they decided to leave it in the movie. In the Ferris wheel scene, Daddario was strapped in with wires and did the scene without a stunt woman. They used a real chainsaw, but removed the blade whenever it was around the other actors. They did have some CGI blood, but it was kept to a minimum. The basement was filmed in the basement of a local supermarket. Since this was Lionsgate and they were trying to have the series take over for Saw, they put a funny little moment in the film where Leatherface meets Pigface. The film took a big risk by turning the townsfolk into the villains and making Leatherface into a sympathetic anti-hero. As with the other films in the series, this had to be edited down to avoid an X rating. In the end, the film cost $20 million and was released into theaters on January 4th, 2013. It opened at number one at the box office and went on to make $47 million over its theatrical run. Not exactly the hit they were hoping for. Daddario and the other cast members that survived signed on for six films, but it's unclear as to whether or not Lionsgate will continue with the franchise. I really hope they do. I enjoyed this movie thoroughly. I had heard so many bad things about this, I was shocked at how good it was when I finally saw it. The nods to the original were great, and I appreciated that it was a sequel, and not yet another remake. I know the 2003 remake is generally liked by the horror community, but I found it bland. They copied too much from the original, and Marcus Nispel's directing is just garbage. Lucenhop's directing was solid, and the movie just felt right. Not as good as the classic 74 film, but I'd easily put it on par with the sequel. I know a lot of people hate this film, and I just don't get it. As a huge fan of the original, I was majorly impressed by how close they stayed to the spirit of the first. Was it perfect? No, but it was still a good time. I could have done without Kenny, and this line is really awful. Well, the taxes, motherfucker. But aside from that, the film kicked ass. The Age of Heather is up for debate, but eh, whatever. It really didn't bother me. If they had to do the movie in the 90s, they would have drastically had to increase the budget, and the whole movie just wouldn't have happened. They put an overwhelming amount of effort into making this feel like an actual sequel, instead of just another copy-paste, with updated effects and music video style directing. I give them way more credit for at least trying. It may not have been a complete success, but it is infinitely better than The Purge. Daddario was great and the practical effects looked wonderful. The story was cool and the new Leatherface did an outstanding job of making him seem like the old Leatherface. Whether or not you like this film, you can't deny that their heart wasn't in the right place. This wasn't a lazy attempt to cash in on a known property. This was a well thought out attempt to expand the storyline that the original started 40 years ago. I feel like they succeeded in doing so. So before you go off saying that this movie ruined the franchise, remember that Matthew McConaughey had robot legs. <laughs> Nikki, what are you doing? <laughs> I told you it was fucked up. <laughs>